Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the INEOS Graduate Recruitment Webinar for 2023. We wanted to use this to give you a chance to hear directly from us about the work we do and, more importantly, the graduate opportunities that we have. Uh, my name is Tom Crotty, and before we started, uh, let's just do a bit of housekeeping. If you've got questions for any of the contributors, please put them in the webinar chat and include who your question is directed to. And we won't be able to get through all of them, but we'll get through as many as we possibly can. And if you're viewing this via a web browser, please click on the slide pack image to enlarge the slides. It's a bit easier for you to see them. Now, before we get started properly, let me take a few minutes to tell you a bit more about INEOS. And let's start with the easy bit, which is a few numbers. You've seen them flashing up on the screen already. We're a large, privately owned multinational company. We've got a turnover of about $65 billion across 31 countries with 25,000 people. We operate through 39 individual businesses with 183 sites, 89 of them in Europe, 58 in the Americas and 36 in Asia. But all the numbers don't really tell you very much apart from our sheer scale. So what do we actually do? Uh, someone actually asked me the other day how I would classify INEOS. What would I classify INEOS as? Chemical company, an energy company, an automotive company, a fashion company, even a sports franchise. And INEOS is all of those things. But if I had to choose to tell people one thing about what we are, before everything else, we are a manufacturing company. We believe passionately that manufacturing sits at the very heart of a thriving and successful economy. It starts with a lower value added product. It creates value and therefore creates wealth, which drives the economy. And it's that wealth that funds the quality of people's lives. It's the wealth that pays for education, for healthcare, for infrastructure, for security, all the things that make for a successful economy. And that's what we are proud to do. We make things. Now, for much of our chemical business, you will never see those things. They're the building blocks for the rest of manufacturing industry. But I guarantee that from the moment you woke up this morning until the moment you go to bed in the evening, you will be using our products because they're there in your shower gel, your toothpaste, your clothing. They're protecting your food and water. They're providing healthcare solutions. They're in the car, train, bus or aircraft that you travel on. They help to provide the energy that you take for granted when you flick a light switch or turn on a radiator. We are at the very heart of the energy transition. We're developing technologies that support renewables. We're developing the new hydrogen economy. And we're constantly creating innovative technologies to ensure that we move to a true circular economy. And we're increasingly turning our face to the public. We've got three growing consumer brands in Bellstaff, in Ineos Automotive and in Ineos Hygienics. And that external brand profile for Ineos is hugely enhanced by our growing range of sports initiatives. Our one third ownership of the Mercedes Formula One team, Ineos Britannia challenging for the America's Cup, the Ineos Grenadiers taking on some of the toughest, toughest cycling races in the world. Our two football clubs, OGC Nice and Lausanne Sport, our sponsorship of Elliot Kipchoge's running team, following from the success of the 159 Challenge when Elliot broke the two hour marathon barrier for the first time, and our sponsorship of the world's most successful rugby team, the New Zealand All Blacks. Philanthropy plays an important part in our outlook. We recently funded the establishment of the INEOS Oxford Institute to seek solutions to the growing threat from antimicrobial resistance. We have a multi-million pound project in the UK supporting 100 of the most deprived schools in the country. We've got major conservation charities in Iceland tackling the threat to Atlantic salmon, in Tanzania trying to establish sustainable ecotourism to protect endangered species from poaching. So describing what we do can be a challenge, but describing how we do it, I think is much easier. And I often think it's easier to define INEOS by how we behave than what we do. At the heart of INEOS, we have three words that we feel sum up our general attitude to life, and they are grit, rigor, and humor. We're a company that takes on challenges that other people shy away from. We're tenacious in finding ways through problems and totally rigorous in everything we do. And at the same time, we know that the heart of people, that's sort of the heart of business, are people. And humour nicely describes an outlook that means we never take ourselves too seriously. 
And we always want to make sure that our employees enjoy the experience of being part of this INEOS family. Which brings us to the chance for you to meet some members of that family, who I hope will be able to give you their personal reflections on what they do. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with George Ratcliffe. And George started with INEOS on the Commercial Graduate Programme, and George is now the Commercial Director of INEOS Enterprises. So, George, welcome. Uh, let me start by asking you to give us a bit of your experience on the Commercial Grad Programme when you started on that. Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for, for joining our call. Um, it was 10 years ago now, so not that long ago, I think, considering what I feel I have achieved and been around in INEOS. But I think for me that the commercial grab program, um, it covers it's over four or five years. And I think it's very fast paced learning. Uh, you get lots of support in that learning. Uh, lots of opportunities to move around the industry. INEOS is, is very big that moving around the industry, you do well within INEOS. So I started in UK, some of my some of my colleagues started in Europe and you rotate and you move around. Um, and I think it's you very much are given a real job on day one. We employ graduates for specific jobs. So you're, you are put in something that needs doing. Um, not just brought into an empty hole and sit and shadowing for a year. So I think you, you're very much you, you're in at the deep end. But I think with lots of good people around you and supporting you and 10 years on, I think all I'd say is the the scene setting of those first few years in the commercial grad scheme are exactly the same as day to day life going on. So it's a really natural, good direction. And I think start into your into your, in your life. It's a very natural transition. Now, George, one of the things that you did across that 10 years was you were part of the team who set up INEOS Hygienics. I'm going to hear shortly from Gabby a bit more about that. But a challenge of brand in the hygiene market, how did that come about and what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, a quick word for those of you who um, haven't heard of it. You certainly have heard of the reason why. Um, a couple of years ago, the start of the pandemic, we looked as INEOS at what we could do as a global company um, to do our part in helping the pandemic. And what we knew we were able to do was we're the world's biggest producer of ethanol, of alcohol. Most of you, I'm sure, in this call will have used INEOS ethanol in itself. Um, and as a result, we knew there was a global shortage of hand sanitizer. Uh, and we built five factories within 10 days, uh, producing a million bottles a month of hand sanitizer, um, which is a huge achievement for a big company or any company on any scale. But I think to have built these factories, these bottling factories in uh, in 10 days each on a global scale, well, I think even us in INEOS, we think we're fast paced. We're quite proud of, of what we achieved. Um, we, um, I think in in that we gave away Four million bottles for free to doctors and nurses nhs and european wide and subsequently actually for the ukraine crisis we actually gave four million bottles away for free to them so a big philanthropic part to it but it's a standalone business that we call ineos hygienics now it was a couple of years ago that i went in to run it as the coo of hygienics and it's the world's a different place now we're not using hand sanitizer as much so the business is having to adapt and pivot into something else but it's a big brand's name as it carries the INEOS name physically on its labels and some of you I'm sure will have used our product um, and then I suppose one final piece on uh, INEOS Hygienics is I think me and my team of people that were in it there's a couple of them on this call uh, Monica and Gabby uh, all out of the, um, the commercial grad scheme and it's a huge responsibility. It was largely new people off the commercial grad scheme were asked to create and run Ineos Hygienics. And a big, just with a big CapEx bill, we spent over 50 million on building factories and sites. And the, the group of us running it and managing it, myself included, were less than 10 years into Ineos. And now you've got a very different role, uh, Georgia, in different, very different business in Ineos Enterprise. Tell us a bit more about uh, that job and how you're responding to what you're now seeing in in a pretty challenging market environment for for everybody. Yeah, no, de definitely a few challenges. And I think any business you work in in Ineos, you've got to have a good view of what's going on globally in because it affects all of our markets and our products we make. Um, like I said, I was sat where a lot of you are on this call 
Well, equivalent 10 years ago, looking at um, before I joined Ineos uh, and 10 years later, I'm today the commercial director of um, of Ineos Enterprise, which is one of the businesses within Ineos, it's a portfolio business. So we've got several businesses that make up what Ineos Enterprise is. Uh, Ineos Enterprise, so our corner of Ineos makes half a billion dollars profit a year. So it's a sizable business. Um, and a couple of the challenges are we've got 26 sites um, around the world. Uh, within Ineos Enterprises in US, Europe and Asia. Um, and in a uh, pandemic world, how do you keep those running? How do you keep those going? Followed into quite a stressful, a lot of um, com- a lot of countries moving into recession. How do you keep those going? Um, so keeping those running, I think, is a big part of our day-to-day uh, energy at the moment. And some countries like, you know, Germany, for example, is having big energy issues more so than lots of the rest of Europe. So as a result, we've even turned one of our sites off there, which shows how affected we are by what's going on in the economy. Um, so, but Ineos, you know, despite that potential recession coming and that it's set in in some countries already, we're very, you know, we, we're very much still investing in the businesses. Um, we're not holding back on um, on the funding of those businesses because you know in a couple of years when it's back to the good times you don't want to you know turn your sites up run them much harder that you haven't invested today and they will shut down so a very good way to say across the competition um and i suppose the other bit is we're always looking at buying and selling businesses within in your enterprise so looking at buying businesses which you were looking at several at the moment um in a in Sort of turbulent economic time, I think, does actually bring on for us the way we see it certain advantages because you know there are companies out there that need cash, they need to sell businesses, so it puts people in a different perspective. And if you are a uh, well-oiled machine and in a good place like in yours is, it means there's some good opportunities of other businesses we can buy at the moment. So those are the two um, two challenges that are keeping me going at the moment. Brilliant, George. Thank you very much. Uh, good examples of grit and rigor there in uh, in both of those businesses. Um, we slight change the advertise program because it's a more natural flow. Uh, we're going to move to to Gabby and then to Claire because Gabby can take you on that story of Ineos Hygienics and bring it up to date. Uh, Gabby is the head of go to market for Ineos Hygienics. So, Gabby, why don't we start by you telling us what that means? Good question. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Gabby here. So Head of Go to Market is in charge of really, um, three really fun departments in Hygienics. So at the moment, that's procurement. It's the project managers in new product development and then also the sales team. So a huge amount of, respons- of responsibility across across three very varied sections of the business there. But um, it's a really exciting one because um, I call it kind of the triangulation of how we bring products um, to life and to market. So the project managers in the MPD department are there all the way at a concept of a product and procurement factors into um, how we procure the raw materials, the packaging, um, keep an eye on those costs. And then they between the two of those departments, they take it all the way to sales to then sell and deliver whilst we maintain kind of an excellent view on those costs, um, ensuring we've got profitability all the way through the chain through sales. So really exciting trio departments, which I look after currently in Hygienics. Great. And uh, just tell us a bit more about the market. I mean, it, you're a challenger in a very established traditional hygiene market. How have we gone about trying to break in and win market share in that that market? It's a really timely question because um, for those of you who um, have been watching national TV um, recently in the UK, we've actually just launched um, an incredible new TV campaign, which goes all the way from um, TV to out of home. So battles on everything from bus stops to in cinemas. And um, rather than it be sort of uh, the kind of normal competitor, homesy, mumsy brand for things like hand wash and sanitizer, um, we've gone really disruptive and it's quite a spicy campaign. Um, it's um, it's really kind of tang- really kind of tangible. It's great music. Um, and we're really hoping to kind of, you know, wake up the market a bit and make sure it's a bit more interesting and get people to pick up um, products off the shelves. Um, and it's really, really snappy. So um, that's the way we're hoping to try and disrupt and, and challenge the market and, and get brand awareness. And, and where do you see the growth opportunities? 
So we, we started in sanitizer. It's our absolute bread and butter. As George um, explained, it comes from um, our strength in the supply chain and that manufacturing excellence where production of ethanol is concerned. So coming from various sites across Europe um, to help build that really strong sanitizer base. Um, but it's it's not enough. So um, we came into the market um, at when the market needed us. So we were there to um, support the NHS and hospitals all over the world um, with their frontline workers um, with this really sort of strong, excellent sanitizer, hospital grade um, product. Um, and we saw the market spike massively at the time. Um, it has since retracted um, as expected to do so. And so whilst we've maintained where our absolute ambition is to maintain that market share, we've got to look for other routes, routes in sort of a similar category. So we've recently expanded to hand wash um, and it's an antibacterial hand wash. So staying true to our sort of our, our, our brand sense, um, which is science and performance. Um, and that's all coincided really nicely with that new marketing campaign. Excellent. And, and uh, George, tell us a little bit about how he got to where he, he is now. Why don't you do the same for us? Tell us a little bit about your INEOS history, Gabby. Yeah, so it works really well alongside George. I actually joined um, near 10 years ago, similar to George on the Commercial Graduate Programme. Um, I'm originally a chemist from the University of Warwick um, and um, spotted the advert for INEOS way back when, before it was a little more well known and a little more in sports teams and things. Um, and have been here ever since. So um, I've had an amazing journey. I think I think George referenced um, Deep End. It's certainly been um, a, re a really challenging experience, but I think experience is the key word there. So I've worked um, in, you know, what, what was a relatively short career in the grand scheme of things. I've done everything from oil and gas to um, polymers, which is our downstream chemicals, midstream chemicals in the form of olefins, um, tackled a huge amount on a sustainability agenda before then ending up in hygienics. And, and whilst doing that in those 10 years, worth noting that that's been across Europe as well. So lived across several countries. Um, really gained experience, um, you know, in, in different working environments, everything from sites to our commercial offices. Um, and, you know, was was so flattered to be able to um, work in hygienics and be offered a role at this stage, looking after, you know, a, a large group of people in three very different departments. So certainly in a, a, a journey, but a huge amount of experience in, in doing so. Great. Thank you very much, Gabby. That gives us a, a nice bit of colour. So appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, and now we're going to move to something very different. Andy is financial controller for Project One. So Andy, talk us through a bit about the roles you've had in INEOS since you joined as a graduate uh, in 2010. Hi Tom, thanks for the introduction. Um, so yes, I joined INEOS in 2010 based in our Lindhurst office, which is set in the heart of the New Forest in the UK. It's a lovely little uh, office um, that we have. Um, my first role was as a cracker business analyst for the olefins and polymers business um, and I was responsible for reporting the business performance of the crackers to senior management um, for the crackers that we operate around Europe um, and at the same time the company actually supported me to obtain my chartered accountancy status um, which took uh, just over three years um, uh, to do following university. Um, during a period of kind of re restructuring of the olefins and polymers business in Europe, um, I took the opportunity to work up in our Grangemouth site in Scotland, which is just outside of Edinburgh. Um, my role here was to support the financing for a large uh, capital investment in a new ethane tank, um, which was critical to the survival of the of the site. Um, the, the tank is essentially to enable us to import ethane from the US, um, which we needed following the decline of um, available feedstock from the North Sea um, and essentially helped to rejuvenate the site. Um, following that, I then became business controller of our INEOS trading and shipping business. Uh, and one of my primary roles was to implement a risk management trading uh, system for the management of our group feedstock procurement activities. Uh, and then this was later extended to our gas trading uh, business following several acquisitions that we made in the oil and gas space. Um, and I was involved in setting up the virtual pipeline that we now operate between the US and Europe to supply ethane to Grangemouth um, and Raffness um, via, our, via our Dragon class vessels. And this brings me to today uh, on Project One, where I mainly have two uh, fundamental roles. Firstly, to ensure uh, effective oversight and control um, of the project. And secondly, to, to finance the project. Um, so we're seeking several billions um, of, of financing for the project, uh, which involves negotiating with a vast array of banks, government agencies and, and a suite of advisors. 
So uh, tell us a little bit more about Project One, actually what it is and, and what it represents. Um, so Project One is Ineos's um, new multi-billion investment in a new world scale ethane cracker in the port of Antwerp. So the port of Antwerp is a is the heart of the chemical cluster in, in Europe and it's actually where Ineos first started uh, in its first production site back in 1998. Um, the cracker is really the heart of the of the petrochemical industry. Um, there, are, there are generally two sort of types of crackers in Europe. Um, we have what we call naphtha based crackers which is a derivative of crude oil and then we have gas based crackers and in Europe today we have around 40 crackers um, and only four of them are, are gas based. So project one will be a new gas based cracker where we essentially take ethane uh, as a feedstock. We heat that ethane in the furnaces to crack it into ethylene uh, and other byproducts, in particular hydrogen, which we're able to reuse in the process as a zero emission fuel. Uh, and essentially we, we make 1.45 million tonnes of ethylene, which as Tom outlined at the beginning is the essential sort of building block for a wide variety of pro um, products that we, are essential to our everyday lives, be it for the construction industry, for med you know, medical applications, uh, for packaging to, to avoid wastage of food um, and to support the energy transition. So it really is key to, the, uh, to reverse the decline in the petrochemical industry in Europe. It's due okay. to come on stream in 2026. Thanks, Andy. And you mentioned um, the energy transition there. W what does uh, Project One mean in terms of sustainability for us? But, I mean, investment in new assets is probably the single biggest thing that any of us can do towards um, the sustainability uh, agenda and then reducing our carbon footprint overall. There's not really been any major investment in Europe for the past uh, 20 years, uh, which means many of the assets are sort of aging and inefficient. So if you apply this analogy to, to a car, the best thing you can do for the environment is to replace your old car, um, which is obviously much more uh, energy inefficient, and buy a new car, which is much more lightweight and, and much more efficient. So project one is, is designed to make the maximum use of the best technology that we have today. Um, and, and sustainability is really designed into the plant um, with the sort of right selectivity of the right feedstock, um, as I say, ethane, which help, which also creates the byproduct of, of hydrogen. Um, it, it also uses the, the cool th um, of the feedstock that we import um, on our ships um, to to uh, to use the energy from from that, and also the recovery from the heat furnaces. And where possible, we're able to to electrify elements of the equipment to make use of renewable power as well. Um, and at the start of operation in 2026, that the carbon footprint of the new cracker will be over two times better than the next best cracker in Europe and today. And this means that customers that are supplied with the ethylene from Project One um, can reduce their CO2 emissions by over 2 million tonnes per year um, as they're no longer dependent on ethylene from more polluting plants. Um, but I think we go a step further than that. We, we've got very clear roadmap ambitions to, to um, get to carbon neutrality within 10 years of operation. That's our target. This does rely on you know, significant investment in key infrastructure in the port of Antwerp, in particular the investment in a new hydrogen uh, network, which Ineos was keen to play a key part of. Um, and certainly in my role uh, as seeking finance for the banks, you know, sustainability is a, is a huge agenda for them uh, in order to support their lending decision. Great. Andy, thank you very much. Stay on the line. We'll probably come back to you, I'm sure. Um, but Claire, we've got you back on. Thank you very much. Sorry about the messing around with the technology. Yes, Great. Sounds nice and clear now. So Claire, um, I, I introduced you as the aerodynamics uh, group leader. Tell us a little bit more about what that means for the layperson. Yeah. OK, so, um, yes, yeah, so I lead a group of um, engineers to really maximise the aero performance of the car. So we have a few different tools that we can use for doing that. So we have a wind tunnel that we can test a scale model of the car in to try and improve the, the downforce. But we can also run um, computational solutions as well, so computational fluid dynamics to really kind of best prepare us for that wind tunnel test. So um, really looking to improve the flow structures and improve the aerodynamics of the car. Um, so it's it's a really um, I love the role because it's very varied. So um, I really sort of technically lead the group. So really trying to identify the sort of key directions that we should be going after. Um, but also I feel like I've um, sort of a leadership role as well. So I feel really um, 
a big um, responsibility for helping to develop the graduates in my group. So we're a very young group, so we have a lot of, of new graduates. Um, and so really kind of just looking to help them develop as best they can and just reach their full potential. And, and clearly, I mean, those of us who follow the sport will recognise this has been a, a challenging year for the team, um, mm. if I could put it that way. Uh, how's the team responded to that? What's the feeling been like in the team through this season? Um, I think it's been a really interesting experience, actually, to go from obviously having had all the years of, of success um, and to obviously being a bit a bit different this year. Um, I think one feeling that I've, I've really noticed is that everyone's really relished the, the sort of challenge of it. Um, I think everyone has actually really enjoyed having a slightly different challenge and um, trying to turn the performance of the car around. Um, really trying to kind of catch up to the front of the grid. And yeah. I think that's one of the big feelings is that people have actually enjoyed that challenge and kind of looked to really, um, yeah, sort of think, OK, well, what can I do to to help improve the car? And um, and I think I've def yeah, definitely noticed that you can really feel that your contribution is really making a difference. Um, so that's been one of the really, really good things that I've really noticed. Um, I think the other thing is that the level of teamwork has been really good. So I think um, we managed to get a big update to the car for Barcelona, which was kind of about the sixth race of the season. Um, and it was a mammoth undertaking, but you could you really noticed the, um, the sort of cycle going around the company. So obviously an aero is kind of where it starts in that you're developing the aerodynamic package. Um, but then, so we'd have like a very high peak workload trying to kind of define the Barcelona package but then obviously it goes through the kind of the design office who have to make those parts for the, design those parts for the race car um, and then it goes through manufacturing and you could see this cycle of work going through the through the company and everyone just kind of giving their utmost to to try and improve the car um, yeah. and, and I think there's been a real um, one of the things I think we're we really try and promote is the sort of no blame culture. So I feel like we didn't all turn around and point fingers at different departments, um, which I think was also a real something that I'm very proud of. Everyone just sort of looked to be like, actually, but what can I do to make the situation better rather than yeah, sort of yeah, looking to kind of apportion blame? Um, and I think the senior management have also kind of admitted where maybe they could have done things differently as well, which I think is a, a pretty impressive thing to do too. So, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's interesting. I mean, we had uh, James Allison in here a few months ago chatting about mm. these issues with some of the teams and, and that came across really strongly from James that no blame culture is essential. Mm. Um, what about learning from from this experience and the feed in for next year? What what how does that process work and what do you think we've learned this year for next year? I think we've learned a lot in terms of um, sort of adapting our processes. So. Um, I feel like the way we work is, you know, trying to kind of put um, very sort of robust processes in place and um, yeah, trust the process and then hope that that, you know, if, if you follow that, the outcome should be what you want. And I think, but I think what we've also been open to is thinking, actually, when do we need to use a slightly different approach to what we've been using? Actually, that's not quite relevant to the situation we're in now. Like some of our tools, our existing tools aren't actually, uh, aren't what we need right now. Um, we actually need to sort of change our approach. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've I've learned from this year is, um, yes, yeah, sort of learning when you need to, yeah, adapt your approach to something um, and not yeah. not do things as you, as you maybe always have done. I, and we've heard a lot in the press over the last few weeks about the cost cap and Red mm. Bull's uh, tribulations around the cost cap. How has the cost cap impacted uh, our work in, in the team? How, what have you seen tangibly? Um, I guess one of the biggest things that's noticeable is is partly the um, the addition of the applied science division. So it links very closely with INEOS. Yes. Um, and I think that's that's a really exciting thing. So it kind of enables us to still to to kind of be very have a bit of flexibility, and it it it's a really interesting point of view from for an aerodynamicist as well so some of the people in my group have been on a, a kind of secondment with the america's cup team so yeah. i think that's a really really brilliant thing that's come from from some of the cost cap is that you um you can go and take some of your learning and apply it onto the boat but then likewise you come back with different knowledge that you've gained different ways of working that you can then bring back with you yeah. so i think in aerodynamics that's been the most noticeable thing is that kind of knowledge sharing from different disciplines and what, what we can learn from that Great. 
Claire, thank you very much. Um, stay Pleasure. around. We're, we're going to open it up from, for, for general questions. Um, so uh, this is your chance. If, if you want to ask a question, just stick it on the chat and uh, and we can check it out. We've got one question, actually two, two linked questions. Um, uh, some of these we, we might pick up a bit later when if they're very specific to the graduate recruitment process, because Caroline will be taking you through that. But um, I've got a question here that's just come in. Um, uh, from Eamon, Eamon Fatnasi. Uh, two main questions. Uh, how can chemical process engineers who don't have a commercial background who apply for the commercial program get involved in commercial related roles? And an associated question, can they maybe start in a technical role and then move to commercial during the program? Um, uh, and uh, I, I mean, I, I think the, the short answer to, to both of those is yes, um, that flexibility is possible. And uh, a bit later on, you're going to be hearing from some of our recent graduates uh, who and, and they'll be telling you about their experience. Uh, and you'll see there some definite crossovers from com from technical into commercial. So we'll come back to that. So um, bear with us on that. Um, any other any other questions? Uh, please, please put them up. Let, let me uh, throw one or two out to, just while we're waiting for more to come through. Uh, oh, sorry. I've, um, I've got one here um, uh, from Sadiq Bukhar. Is there any difference between the commercial and engineering graduate program? The answer is yes, but uh, th th there are subtle differences. And Caroline's going to be taking you through that a bit later on. So come back to that one. Uh, from uh, Rosie, I'm very interested in the commercial program, but the five year sign on is a little bit intimidating. What if I decide it's not for me? Again, Caroline will, will pick that one up a bit later on. Um, uh, there was a question here uh, for George. When you initially built the hand science factories in such a short space of time, did you have to make any compromises to meet the deadline? And I think George has had to go off to another meeting, so I'm not sure he's still on. If he is, he can shout now. But otherwise, I'm going to ask that, uh, throw that one to Gabby. Yeah, with pleasure, Tom. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm smiling away because, yes, absolutely, there were some compromises we had to make. And I think you always have to judge risk on every commercial decision you, you do make. Um, and I, I'm sort of giggling away because one thing that does spring to mind is, you know, we're, we're, I'm actually a chemist who's gone into commercial and you never know what's going to land on your desk at INEOS. Um, but we had to very quickly design labels and procure barcodes for sanitizer bottles. And I can tell you that was a few weeks of my life of getting labels designed, sorted, making sure you've got the right biocidal regs on them, something called CLP packaging guidelines. I mean, you learn every day. So we definitely didn't get them 100% squeaky clean right on the first attempts. And it's been evolving material. Um, but that would that would be a perfect example of compromise, judging the risk at the time. What was the end goal that was supplying the NHS with free of charge um, hand sanitizer donations at the front line? Still the right thing to do. Great. Thank you very much. Um, while we're waiting for some other questions, let me ask. Uh, let me ask one to Andy. Uh, Andy, uh, a question people often ask: Can you tell us how you balance a busy job with a home life? Yeah, that's a very interesting one. Um, I actually have two young children, um, so one is uh, four years old, uh, a little boy called Harry, uh, and, a, and a girl uh, who's just about to turn two called Emily. And uh, yes, uh, it, you know, it, they do keep me on my toes at home um, and it is, you know, it can be quite challenging at times. I always try to make sure that I am at least home for bedtime to make sure that I can read them a, a nice bedtime story. Um, and certainly when I am with them, I make sure I focus my time with them. And I'm not looking at emails all the time. Um, so, uh, so yes, it, it can be challenging, but I think uh, you make it work. OK, thanks, Andy. Uh, I've got a question in from uh, Alexander. Um, just have a look. Uh, lost it. Now there we are. Uh, from Alexander Prem, how big is the automotive part of the commercial program? Is it possible to dedicate for the automotive division beforehand or during the program? Um, uh, again, I think Caroline will pick that up a bit later on. Um, I mean, one of the key things that we're looking for in developing our commercial graduates is breadth. Uh, and so we do tend to move people around uh, and give them experience. And Gabby explained the, the various roles she's been in, as did George. And I think it, it's that breadth that's helpful. 
Um, so we, we'll again, we'll put it on the list for Caroline later on. But I think you, you, please, you know, think broadly that the, the benefit of that breadth will stand you in great stead. Um, Claire, let me ask you a question. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be for the team uh, going into next season? I think it's just trying just trying to close the close the gap to the front really um i think just um trying to over the winter just um it's always a really difficult period in formula one i think because you haven't got the um the check-in point that you have at the moment of every few races kind of knowing how you're doing so it's this kind of longer period over the winter where you haven't necessarily got that check-in of where you are relative to the competition um so it's just sort of trusting that you are going in the right direction but and also just just the right amount of questioning of yeah are we doing the right thing here is this the right route to go down um that right balance of um yeah uh, clear goals that we've set but regularly reviewing just making sure that we're not not going down the wrong route um and just trying to keep the um yeah tr trying to keep your kind of um motivation up when you haven't necessarily got that that regular check-in of the races if that makes sense it does. Thank you very much. OK, I think um, we, we're going to stick straight to time. We're bang on time at the moment. So a um, uh, big thank you to, to George, to Gabby, to Claire and to Andrew for their time and their insights. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed hearing a bit more about INEOS uh, and understanding a bit more about what we do and the types of roles that we have. I'm going to hand over to Caroline now, who's going to explain more about our graduate programmes. And later, you'll be able to hear, as I said, from some of our current graduates, get some practical tips on applying. Uh, before we do that, we've got a little film to show you, and that's about a Namibia trip that graduates have the opportunity to participate in, which I think you'll find is pretty distinctive uh, and different for really us. Part of the INEOS philosophy is to encourage people to take on more. One should, if one can, try and maximise the number of days that are unforgettable. Many large companies provide programmes for graduates in terms of providing training and experiences and teamwork bonding. INEOS is different in terms of that's not going to be done in the, in the New Forest or in the Cotswolds or in the Lake District it's going to be in Africa. Of course, Namibia is a, it's a fantastic place for adventures. The scenery is stunning, but it really needs a good grit and determination. Simply participating in these conditions, it's a really good place then to, to, to work together and to get through the challenges. We wanted to make it a proper challenge, but something which people would feel at the end of the trip would really accomplish something personally. Running and biking are things that anybody can, can have a go at, and, and that's sort of accessible to anybody. For any graduate coming here, I'm sure we'll have a fulfilling time. To then feel the emotion and the satisfaction of an achievement at the end of it, I mean, that's what it's all about. It's remarkable how much people can do and how much they can accomplish and people they sort of got these brakes on in the head but when you take the brakes off it's remarkable what you can achieve. and good afternoon everybody. So just to introduce myself and where I sit in in the INEOF team, uh, so my name is Caroline and with my team we recruit graduates onto our commercial graduate programme and we also run the corporate events which is all graduates across INEOS you get the opportunity to attend. So that will be 12 months into joining INEOS we'll get the opportunity to meet you. So that video I think gives a real feel as to what makes INEOS very different as a company to work for and we'll be very shortly hearing from Valt and Monica who Valt is currently training ready to head to Namibia next year and Monica has very very recently returned so I'm sure Monica will touch on that also. 
I am keeping an eye on all the questions coming in. So I think if I've done my job correctly, um, I will hopefully have answered a lot of those questions for you. But please do keep plucking them in. Um, and we will hopefully have some time at the end of the webinar to go through all of those questions for you. So my um, what I'm hoping to talk you through right now are the graduate programmes that we run here at INEOS. And we do hire onto both an engineering and a commercial programme. So we've heard a lot so far from George and Gabby about the commercial program, but I'll, what I'll start with is just talking you through the engineering program that we do run. So we recruit across all major disciplines in engineering from mechanical, chemical, electrical engineering, and you will be based on one of our major manufacturing sites in either Europe or the UK. So within the UK, you will be given the opportunity to become chartered and as part of that, an opportunity to move around assets and to develop your competence on site. So engineering is the heart of INEOS um, and as part of the engineering programme, it may not be apparent straight away where you want to end up in five years time, but it may be more of a technical discipline or you may decide that you would like to lead a team and become a future operations director. So this programme um, is four to five years programme uh, in length and will give you the opportunity to, as you're spending time on the programme, decide if you'd like to specialise um, or lead a team for the future. So Valt, who we will hear from very shortly, joined INEOS in 2019, uh, based in our final business in Belgium. So we'll shortly talk you through his experience on the engineering programme. So the second program is our commercial program, and this is for people that are more interested in a business role. So the path that Gabby um, and Monica are taking, and also um, George has spoken through earlier. So the purpose of this program, um, and one of the comments on the chat is four to five years sounds uh, quite a long time, and it is. Uh, but here at INEOS, we really believe in real jobs from day one. So we're looking to develop you um, into these roles. You will move around on rotation. So you will generally do three rotations of two to one year in duration, and they will generally be a new country, a new business and a different function. So by the end of the program, you've had lots of challenges, um, developed lots of skills from a technical and a soft, perspective, soft skills perspective, and also developed and grown your network within INEOS. So just in terms of the um, backgrounds of people that we look for to hire onto our graduate program, so we're looking for highly numerate people. We generally are recruiting engineers um, and are open to STEM subjects as well. And just on the point, I think you will be able to pick up, um, I guess, uh, from hearing from our, our INEOS uh, team members on, on, on what we look for. We like positive can do attitudes, people that are very action driven um, and that thrive on challenge um, because you are given an awful lot of responsibility from day one. And we want to make sure that we are recruiting people that really see that as a great opportunity and thrive in that scenario. There is lots of support available, so you'll be given a mentor from day one, which will be a senior member of the team. There's soft skill training, which is provided uh, centrally. And also we run um, the corporate events, which I mentioned earlier. So we run a year one event, which you will attend when you've been in the business for a year. And that's based in our Cologne site. So we get all of our UK and European graduates together. There's a year three event, which is very aptly um, after your third year in the business, and that's based in London. So we have four days together and we get all of our graduates globally to attend this event. And at this stage, you get the opportunity to raise your hand and say that you would like to take part in the Namibia challenge. So that was a whistle stop tour in terms of the two major um, graduate programmes that we do offer here at INEOS. We have a lot of information available on the website. If you look at INEOS.com into careers and graduates, we've got information about both of the programmes, about our year one and year three events. We've got two videos on there. Um, but I will now hand over to Valt, if that's OK, if you could talk through your experience on the engineering programme. Sure, yes. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Wout Wolf and I'm a process project engineer at INEOS Fino in uh, Antwerp, based in Belgium. Um, maybe to start, I can share some things about my background. Uh, I studied civil engineering at the Catholic University of Leuven. Um, the first year consists of uh, general courses and after that I uh, did uh, chemistry as my major and material science as my as my minor. 
um, after completing my bachelor, I uh, my last two years consisted of the master uh, chemical engineering technologies. Um, after graduating, uh, I joined Ineos Fino in Antwerp, uh, which you should be able to see on the screen right now. The, you can see the plant. Um, I started as a process project engineer. Uh, Ineos uh, is the world's largest producer of phenol and acetone. Uh, the business consists of uh, around 600 people located in uh, five plates in five locations worldwide. Uh, we have a plant in Antwerp in Belgium, one in uh, Gladbeck and in Marvel in Germany, and one in Alabama and Texas in the USA. I work in the, the plant of Antwerp, uh, which was constructed in 1992. Uh, in 2001, Ineos acquired the plant from the, the German company Phenolchemie. Um, in the following year, years, uh, the production capacity uh, more than tripled, making Ineos Phenol Antwerp the, the largest uh, phenol production facility worldwide. Um, the Plants in Marl and in Texas produce cumene, starting from benzene and propylene, uh, while the plants in Antwerp, uh, Gladbeck and uh, Alabama um, produce uh, phenol, acetone and alpha methylstyrene, starting from cumene. Um, to briefly explain uh, the process, uh, air is added to cumene in, in large reactors, uh, where then uh, CHP is formed, cumene hydroperoxide, uh, further on in the process, uh, um, this CHP is then split into phenol and acetone. Um, and after that, the mixture of phenol, acetone and a lot of other components is then uh, uh, separated in our distillation unit. Um, phenol is an essential precursor in a wide range of uh, applications in electronics, in the, the automotive industry, in the construction industry. Um, important applications are, for example, insulation materials, uh, laminates, uh, bumpers of cars and so on. It is also uh, used in the medical world, uh, for example, in sprays to, uh, to treat a sore throat. Um, acetone, on the other hand, is a little bit more well known uh, and is mostly used for solvents, for example, such as a nail polish remover. Um, and then also uh, more about my function as a process project engineer. The job title itself uh, describes the two main aspects which I focus on. Um, the process uh, part consists out of preparing and participating in HAZOP studies, doing bump calculations and analyzing problems which occur in the process together with uh, production engineers. Uh, the other main part of my job um, uh, uh, is project our projects as a project engineer I'm involved in almost all the phases of projects which you can see on the screen uh, um, we collect all uh, ideas from colleagues all over the plant and we develop concepts for them um, when the concept is de fully determined uh, the engineering starts um, I'm not in, I don't do the detail engineering myself but uh, I'm involved in the review of it together with uh, a lot of colleagues uh, from all the other disciplines. Um, after the engineering phase, uh, uh, the execution starts. Here I uh, mostly do uh, budget follow-up um, and troubleshooting. Um, in the end, when uh, a project is uh, completely finished, we hand it over back to the production department. Um, something more about the graduate program, which was already uh, mentioned. Um, I started in it shortly after I joined INEOS. In 2019, I was invited to take part in it. Um, people who just uh, graduate or recently graduate and start certain positions in INEOS, uh, they are uh, given the chance to, to join it. Um, the process, uh, the program consists out of a, a wide variety of training, such as performance management and negotiating techniques, uh, which are skills which are cr crucial in, in the industry. Um, Next to these uh, next to these trainings, the, the, the program is uh, marked by three uh, milestones, which are the year one and year three event and the Namibia challenge, which Caroline already mentioned. The, the, the year one event is held in Cologne in Germany uh, for the European grads and the year three event is held in the, the headquarters of London, uh, where the USA grads uh, are able to join. 
Um, the purpose of these events is to uh, help you give a broader view of Ineos as a, as a major uh, petrochemical company um, and also focuses on skills which Ineos deems important for your development. Um, you also get to know more about key financial metrics on how to communicate uh, more effectively and you also get to hear from top Ineos executive uh, about uh, things as uh, how CAPEX is approached, how Ineos does acquisitions, how Ineos is as a group. Um, you also get to know your colleagues from all over the world. You get to know them better in group activities such as business games, uh, which are very interesting. Um, you also get to meet, uh, you get the chance to meet uh, some of the top Ineos senior management, which is uh, yeah, fascinating. Uh, then at the end of the year uh, three event in London, uh, you get more information about uh, the Namibia challenge uh, and you get the invitation to sign up for it, which I happily said yes to. Um, my, my colleague uh, Monica will tell you more about it in a, in a few moments, uh, which will make me even more excited for it than I already am. Uh, back over to Monica in the UK. Thanks very much, Bout. Um, firstly, pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Um, yeah. I'm Monica and I've just finished the European Commercial Programme um, and I'd like to take you through a few slides that, that depict my journey through that programme and uh, through INEOS so far. So first off, like Gabby, uh, I'm also a chemist. I uh, completed four years at the University of Bath doing an undergraduate master's uh, and then moved on to, to do a PhD at UCL. And throughout this time, like some of you in the chat, I've noticed um, I increasingly became interested in, in business, um, but I wasn't really sure exactly which discipline. I also didn't really want to let go of, of science and engineering. Uh, and that's why INEOS for me um, was, was sort of the perfect uh, candidate for an employer to look at because um, on that European commercial programme, you get to experience the different commercial roles uh, to, to find uh, your niche, let's say, um, whilst getting a, a broad sense of experience. Um, but, you know, the, the, the markets that we operate in are still very much uh, within the, uh, the science and engineering space. So on to the next picture. Uh, and that is where I first started uh, within the within the program, uh, and this is Frankfurt in Germany. So I started in in one of Ineos's uh, biggest businesses, um, Ineos Styrolution, uh, and that is a Styrenix producer. So um, Styrenix are the building blocks of of various applications from from coffee machines to uh, to medical devices. And in Styrolution, I held two roles. Uh, first off a year in procurement and followed by two years in, in business management. So I was the commercial product manager of two of our Styrenix product lines. Um, and what that means is, is you're accountable for the, for the general um, management of, of, of those products. Um, so responsibility for, for the profit and loss. Um, Day-to-day -day activities included setting quarterly or, or, or monthly pricing, um, as well as you know co cost optimizations, effectively using different levers, uh, really to maximize uh, the profit margins of those product lines. And I think you know a couple of people have, have mentioned it in the chat. It, it is a long program, uh, but as Caroline alluded to, you, you really get responsibility and, and real jobs from day one. Um, you, you're not shadowing. Uh, you're, you're not you know simply doing menial tasks you you are chucked into the deep end but but with uh with support and training along the way um and i think a, a real unique aspect uh, of the ineos program is is that you do get to have these experience in experiences in a, in a foreign country so you know it's one thing going on holiday for a couple of weeks uh or or even a extended sabbatical for a few months but living somewhere for three years, you really get to understand the culture, learn the language uh, and create you know, lifelong experiences. Um, I know I won't forget my time in Frankfurt anytime soon. Um, so then after my three years, up came the next rotation. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't Lewis Hamilton's agent, although I would have loved that. Uh, I was the com commercialization manager 
um, for the INEOS sanitizer dispenser, which is that cool looking box to the right of Lewis, um, which uh, is a product in the wider portfolio of INEOS Hygienics. So working alongside uh, Gabby and George um, in, in that innovative period whereby we were um, looking at gaps in the market and, and looking to address them in, in such a, a pertinent time for, for the world, really. And, and one of those gaps was that INEOS uh, identified um, the need for a, a stylish, well-engineered uh, dispenser rather than sort of the, the very uh, clinical hospital looking dis looking like dispensers that, that you traditionally see uh, out in the world. And, you know, to really encourage people that that hand sanitization is is a significant part of day to day life going forward, uh, which, which still holds true today. Um, so my role as commercialization manager, well, I mean, the names in the title, it was to help bring that product to market. Um, and yeah, as, as Gabby spoke to earlier as well, a, a wide variety of roles um, from from pricing, strategy, marketing. Uh, I think one of the most noteworthy memories uh, was actually leading the um, the photo shoots uh, where where this photo was taken. It's something that I absolutely never thought uh, would would ever uh, occur in my life uh, working for a chemicals company. Um, but I mean, I think that that is INEOS. It, it's full of surprises and experiences uh, that you you absolutely grasp uh, with both hands. Uh, and talking about experiences, uh, the next slide. Well, that's the uh, the top of the Brandenburg mountain in Namibia. I think I'm somewhere there holding on to a rock uh, as I have a, a very slight fear of heights. Um, but yeah, w without sounding too cheesy, uh, it's the best week of my life. Um, I think Tom spoke to it earlier. Uh, yeah, the, the three words that are the core values of INEOS are grit, uh, determination and um, rigor and, and humor. And you know the Namibia trip epitomizes them all. Yes, uh, you, know, you have to dig deep uh, during both your training and out there. Uh, some of the some of the days are are long, um, but it does not matter what what fitness level you start on or or your experience with with sport to date. You are given all of the the tools, um, training plans, nutrition guidance. Uh, all the help you absolutely need to get you to to that desert uh, in your third year of the programme. And and on the humour side of it, I think, you know, that's quite self-explanatory. But I think the, the key there is you, you're not doing this alone. Um, the the success of, of the trip each year is uh, is marked on everyone finishing as a group. Um, it's not about personal you know, performance. It's absolutely not a race. So as you all bumble through the uh, the Namib desert together, uh, there's plenty of laughs to be had. Um, some tears also, uh, predominantly though, as you all finish that uh, cross that finish line together. Um, I know I know I shed a few tears, uh, mainly because it was over. So I'm very very jealous of Vout, who has this uh, yet to come still. And so now that I'm back. Uh, the the final slide. Um, so as I said, I've finished the program now, uh, and I'm now in what's called my exit role. And I've recently joined uh, one of the newer businesses to Ineos, actually Ineos Aromatics, uh, a recent acquisition from BP. And my role is uh, commercial manager of Infinia. And Infinia is a, a depolymerization technology that takes uh, difficult to recycle uh, PET waste that's otherwise uh, set for, for, for landfill or incineration uh, and breaks it back down into its building blocks ready for, for reuse. So enabling that, that circular economy. Um, and you know, this is the perfect exit role for me because it, it's taken all of my experience that I've had to date, built on it, but also allowing me to, to really make a difference on the sustainability agenda, which you know, is something that's taken very seriously uh, across the whole INEOPS group. So thank you all very much. Uh, happy to answer any questions later and I hand back over to Caroline. Thank you, Monica. I can only imagine uh, that arriving at Lewis Hamilton's photo shoot was uh, not what you imagined when you were applying for the commercial graduate programme. <laughs>
Um, so just wanted to now talk you through the application process for our graduate programmes. Um, so we're having some questions in relation to that in the chat. So again, hopefully I will answer all of those for you. But if I'm not, feel free to pester us on the chat there. And um, I will just start by saying that within INEOS, we don't have a big corporate structure um, in terms of a central head office from a HR perspective. So if you are applying from the commercial program, the likelihood is you will speak to myself or one of the team, and we will be your point of contact throughout your application process. If you're applying for one of the engineering programs, then the likelihood is your point of contact will be a local, um, the local site. The process in terms of application process I'm going to talk you through now won't vary dramatically, but there might be some uh, slight differences there. So in terms of application process, all roles and programmes are advertised on our website. So that's ineos.com. If you go to careers at the top and click on graduates, all of the vacancies are live there. So currently we have the commercial scheme, which is open now, and we are speaking to candidates um, through their process at the moment. And just in terms of timing, so we do look to make offers before Christmas time for the commercial programme. So we are likely to close applications at the end of November and holding assessment centres by early December. And as I said, offers out before Christmas. Quite often we will do rolling recruitment. So it might be that we reopen towards the start of next year. Um, but if you are very keen, I would recommend you just keep an eye on the job board and pop in your application. So all roles will start with you submitting a CV and a covering letter. So I'm not going to give you um, a masterclass in CV writing. I'm sure they're very well polished. But in terms of the covering letter, we're not looking for pages and pages of everything you found out about INEOS. We're really keen to find out a little bit more about you that maybe doesn't come through on your CV. Um, why you think you're suitable for the programme you're applying for and what you know about INEOS, um, but keep it succinct, keep it high level. The next stage um, that we do have on the commercial programme is what we call pre-screening questions. So by this point, we've reviewed your CV, you're with a member of our team, and we will email you um, a number of questions we'd like you to work on. So without giving um, the game away, what I can say is we're just keen to understand what you know about INEOS, um, about the industry, and I guess why you think you would be suitable. So similar concept to your covering letter, but targeted questions which we're looking for you to answer. The next stage then would be an assessment centre and generally they will always comprise of a HR competency based interview. So we are very keen to get to know more about you, your interests, but also we're asking you uh, competency based questions. So looking for, for you to give us examples of times where you've dis demonstrated behaviours. Um, the, you know, the themes you've heard from Monica and our values at INEOS, I think, have come very clear on this webinar. Um, so uh, recommend that you do some more research into INEOS. Um, and we will also ask you to take part in a group exercise. So we're very keen to see how you work with a team to solve a problem. As part of the commercial programme, no big surprise, we will be asking you to partake in a commercial interview. So that will be with a senior member um, of one of our businesses. And then our final stage is always a face to face interview with a board member. So for the commercial programme, it will be um, some further commercial interviews and there will be an analysis exercise, which we ask you to um, deliver as part of the day. I can promise you it's not as scary as it sounds. So you're given a set amount of time to work on um, a case study and we ask you to present it to us. What I would say is if you are looking to apply to any of our programmes, there's lots of information on the website, including a frequently asked question document. So I recommend you read through that before you put your application in. In terms of general feedback that we do get on our process, and hopefully it's come through today, is we're very personable. The approach is we don't spit things out of a system. Your contact will be with an actual human um, and you will um, be put through the process fairly quickly as well. So we have a very short, fast process um, and we value getting to know you. The fit within INEOS is very, very important for us and for you. And we're getting to know you um, as part of the whole recruitment process from when you're putting your um, PSQs into your telephone interview all the way through to the final interview. 
So what I will do now is hand over to Yasmin, who can talk through firsthand how she experienced the um, assessment process at INEOS. So Yasmin joined us just two months ago, is based in our London office um, and can talk you through her experience applying to the programme. Um, yeah, thank you, Caroline. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yasmin, and I am a feedstock trading analyst um, with INEOS Trading and Shipping. Um, prior to that, prior to joining INEOS, I was at Newcastle University and Imperial College London. <clears throat> so I did a um, bachelor's in chemical engineering, and then I moved on to Imperial College to um, do a master's in advanced chemical engineering with some finance. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to take you through um, a few few things that actually stood out to me um, during my application process last year, around this time. Um, so I think the next slide, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so the application process was virtual. Um, I actually submitted my application in the first week of October last year, and um, I received an offer in the third week of December. So like Caroline said, it's a very swift process um, and the turnaround time was about three months or even even less than three months, um, which was very, very swift, swifter than all the other applications I had in the pipeline at that time. Um, um, even though my my process was virtual because um, last year was still recovering from COVID and, you know, Enios had to take um, precautionary measures as expected. Um, I got to meet up with a few members of the team that I was going to be joining um, in trading and shipping, as well as with um, HR. So I got to meet up with um, Annie and Emily, which was really nice, um, you know, to build that kind of in-person relationship um, before joining joining the team and to meet the people that I was going to be working with. Um, and they were all lovely. Um, yeah, so if we can just move on to the next slide, please. I'd love to... Um, sure a few things that stood out to me um, during the process. Um, the first thing is that the process felt very personal. And like Caroline said, you're meeting up with a person. You're not um, partaking in an on-demand video interview. Um, you are actually building a relationship with someone via, you know, um, in, well, this year is going to be in person, but, you know, at my time it was via Zoom. Most of the applications that I had in the pipeline were full of psychometric tests and on-demand interviews. Um, I didn't feel like they were getting to know me. Um, I feel like INEOS, apart from um, getting to know about my competencies and kind of what kind of value I was going to add to their business, they were also trying to get to know me as a person. So, um, you know, letting my personality shine through was very important. And I think that spoke volumes um, to me about INEOS and how important it was to kind of fit into the INEOS culture where everyone um, is, you know, very open, very friendly um, and also, you know, very um, easy to work with and ready to work. Um, another thing that, you know, um, stood out to me was um, the feedback that I got at every stage in the process, which was very helpful. Um, I received feedback um, after my assessment center, which I took on and reflected on before my final stage interviews. So that really helped. And it showed that INEOS was ready to help and it showed that they valued me um, even during the application process. Um, and it really showed how, how much INEOS valued um, finding the right people to be the next generation of leaders, um, which is very, very important. Um, and another thing that showed that was the fact that INEOS um, engaged very senior members of your team. So I met, as, as well as meeting up with grads, um, I met up with um, managers, I met up with CEOs and board members um, who interviewed me. And that really um, kind of put INEOS in a very good light. Um, and INEOS really stood out to me. To be honest, I fell in love I fell more in love with INEOS the, the deeper I got into the process. Um, so that was great. So when I received the, the offer, it was just the best thing ever because I was ready to, you know, get get um, join the team and, um, yeah, add value and meet members of my team. Um, yes, yeah, so in, to wrap up, I just want to take you through kind of what I do 
at the moment, I actually just joined in Ineos in September. So I've been here just over a month. Um, I am in trading and shipping. And the two things that we do in trading and shipping is, number one, we act as a um, product procurement function for the assets. So we basically import um, gas and oil products from the U.S. Gulf into Europe. And the other thing that we do is act as, uh, sorry, we um we do speculative trading um, of gas and oil products. Um, and I am, I'm an analyst. So what I do is I, um, every day I keep up with the oil and gas and oil and gas products markets and um, really, you know, really any, any changes um, to my team and to the wider business as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm only one month in and so much responsibility has been given to me. And also in, in the times that we're in as well, you know, with um, the 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 Russia, Russia, Ukrainian war, the um, recession that we, we're in at the moment, um, you know, inflation. Um, there's so many things happening at the moment and um, China on lockdown. Um, so it makes my job really engaging um, and really um, fun. And um, one thing that I would say is you wouldn't get bored at Ineos. There's always something to do. There's always something to read about. Um, and everyone is just um, rooting for you. Um, I've got people around me that are contributing to my development day in, day out. Um, I could ask questions whenever I want to, if I don't understand anything and they're ready to help. And um, yeah, I would recommend this grad scheme um, to anyone that wants to apply. So yeah, that wraps up everything that I'd like to share. Um, I'd hand back over to Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, for that. That was great. And hopefully just echoes everything I was talking about in terms of how we want to come across throughout the interview process and, you know, Yasmin being able to talk you through how she felt um, as well. So we do have some questions coming in, so feel free to still keep sending them in to us. So I've got one for you, Monica, which is your current role. How did you essentially land in that position? So did you apply for it? Was it based on your previous experience? Yeah, uh, good question. I think all of the above. Uh, I think the thing with INEOS, because you're getting real jobs from day one, not just from exiting the program, uh, it's also about what's available at the time. I mean, when I started INEOS, hygienics didn't exist. Uh, INEOS Aromatics wasn't part of the portfolio. So it's very difficult to, let's say, map your, map your career path from day one. But what you can be assured is that you will always be adding to the experiences that you've got. So for example, you won't be in procurement for five years. Um, you will be in different functions in order to, to give you as much exposure to different um, like levers of the business and, and make you a rounded uh, commercial asset to Ineos uh, from, from the very first day that, that you come in, um, as, as Yasmin is, is experiencing right now. Um, so it is something that I actively applied to. Um, I, I like sustainability. I think it, it's you know, it's a huge challenge for everyone, particularly our industry. Uh, and if you know if we're really going to make a good go of of, of climate change, it, it has to come from from people like us. Thank you, Monica. Um, and what I would just add is, as part of being on the graduate program, you have. Um, opportunity to, to 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 speak to senior managers your mentor and also work with HR on your personal development plan so when you join on the commercial program we are moving you around and that's in conjunction with with you in terms of the roles we have available but also where you know what your preference is we take that into account as well of course but also on the engineering program um, you will have access to HR as well um, and to a personal development plan so a question to Gabby, please. How did you find the transition from uh, chemistry to commercial? Oh, I've been looking forward to answering that. <laughs> um, good question. So um, I will be very honest. I also did a little bit of additional management in my course at chemistry. So before I, I claim to be a complete 100% and mad scientist, I did do an extra layer at the Warwick Business School. That said, though, I'm a massive believer in chemistry being a really kind of logical um, 
a subject and I think that goes for all of the sciences um and I I mean I'm, I'm still the, the reason I loved chemistry is because I, I'm still a massive believer in the fact that you can have a period periodic table in front of you and deduce a huge amount um you know in any kind of setting and it doesn't take loads of memorizing from books or, or study that way and and I still think that applies to business so that common sense um feature and that logical piece analytical problem solving all of that stuff is such an obvious transition into kind of day-to-day -day business and and I mean from from that perspective it's so so smooth because you're just applying all of those same transferable skills um and with the added benefit that you've got really kind of deep analytical skills from a very technical subject so um from my perspective um I think all you can do is kind of win from being in a very kind of technical uh, you know chemistry or any scientific subject in, in the move to commercial right thank you Gabby Monica, have you got anything else to add on that one? Uh, not much, just to also say uh, every day is a school day. I mean, I'm still learning. I think we're all still learning. I think you'll always come into contact with things that, that you've not necessarily um, been exposed to before, uh, especially as you as you progress in your experience. So having flexibility and a can do attitude, uh, I don't see I don't see why you'd have any problems. Thank you both. So we've got a question from Andreas who's asked, um, I'm very flexible in moving between countries. Is it necessary to be fluent in French, for example, if I have to work in France? So um, the answer, everyone's shaking their head, Andreas, so the answer is no. Um, so we do support um, where appropriate on language lessons, but we, yeah, you do not need to speak the local language um, if, you know, when, when moving around. Another question we are getting just in terms of application timelines. So I may have answered that um, when I was talking through the section on application process. But just to clarify, for the commercial program, we do look to make offers uh, just before Christmas. We do also recruit throughout the year. So do recommend you keep an eye on the boards um, because roles will pop up. And we do have flexibility on start date because we are putting you into real jobs as they arrive and um, there is flexibility so we don't have a rigid start date of 1st of September or October to start and um, so if you are have already graduated and are available to start now as you are speaking to us through your application process do just just make that very apparent. Another question we're getting is around visa sponsorship and um, so for the commercial graduate program we do require you to be mobile around Europe and the UK um, but for specific engineering site based roles and other roles on our website that will be role dependent. So again, just just keep an eye on the job board there. Okay, I'm just going to see if there are any more questions that we haven't answered because we have a little bit more time. I think that is all of the questions today. Oh, sorry, Daniel, you asked because it, you missed the first half. So it will be recorded and it will be live on our website very shortly. Um, so for those of you that enjoyed it and would like to watch it again, feel free to log on to the website. Um, and for those of you who missed the start, um, it will be available. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for the panellists um, for dialing in and sharing with us your experience at INEOS. And please do keep an eye on the website uh, for the vacancies uh, on a graduate program that will pop up very shortly and have a good day, everyone. Thank you.